Great, great. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Jamie O'Hare, and I serve as the chair of tonight's event, hosted by the Pollard Memorial Library Foundation. Uh, we're delighted and grateful to have you join us for our 14th annual and our first virtual Meet the Author Night, featuring award-winning author Jenna Bloom. While we can't be in person at the beautiful library tonight, our hope is that the evening will, is just as enjoyable. And as you can see with my background, I was feeling a little nostalgic, so I threw that, threw that back there. Uh, that's the room we typically would be in. Um, established in 1994, the Pollard Memorial Library's Foundation's mission is to secure the additional funding necessary to ensure that the library achieved its goal of excellence in providing service to the citizens of the greater local community throughout the next century. The Foundation's goals are as follows, to provide support and maintenance to the Pollard Memorial Library, to provide funds and services which supplement but do not replace customary support of the library by the city, and lastly, to engage in fundraising for the support of the library, its goals and activities. And speaking of funding, fundraising, I'd like to thank our sponsors whose continued generosity over the years have made this event possible tonight. Our platinum sponsors are Enterprise Bank, the Demoulis Foundation, Nancy Donahue, and George and Carol Duncan. Our gold sponsors are Catherine and Arthur Coviello, Patricia and Thomas Kennedy, Rosemary Noon and Paul Marion, and Donna and Peter Richards. Our silver sponsorship level was so generously subscribed that the names are too numerous to mention. Uh, these names are listed on our sponsor sheet and, and have been in all email communications. So thank you all to all the sponsors. Many thanks should also be extended to the entire foundation board whose hard work and dedication provided the needed action steps to make tonight possible. I'd like to give an extra special thank you to Belinda Jurin, our board's chair, for her support and hard work throughout the entire event planning process. Also, thanks to her Zoom expertise, we're able to run this event tonight. So thank you very much, Belinda. I have a couple quick items I wanna remind you all before, we, uh, we, before I introduce Jenna. So first is Zoom, we're on the Zoom platform tonight, uh, and we're gonna be trying to control the audio on the individual computers to prevent any additional noise or feedback. And also we'll be spotlighting the speaker's screen when they are talking. Questions for Jenna can be entered in the chat feature on the Zoom panel. Uh, she will be looking at it as well as myself throughout the event, uh, and there'll certainly be time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, lastly with Zoom, that this event is being recorded, uh, hopefully for some future use or with, with you. Uh, the books, typically we have a representative from UMass Lowell of their bookstore selling books, but obviously we can't do that tonight in person. Uh, but Jenna's books are available for purchase through the UMass Lowell bookstore. Uh, and all the contact information for the purchases is in the email that we've sent out to you folks. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our guest of honor. Jenna Bloom is the New York Times internationally bestselling author of novels, Those Who Save Us, The Storm Chasers, and The Lost Family as well as the novella, The Lucky One, in the anthology Grand Central, and numerous short stories. Jen is also one of Oprah's top 30 woman writers and CEO co-founder of literary social media company, A Mighty Blaze. Jenna's first novel, Those Who Save Us, was a New York Times bestseller, the number one best-selling novel in Holland in 2011, and the winner of the 2005 Ribelow Prize. The Storm Chasers was an international bestseller, a Borders book club selection, a feature in French L and a target pick. The Lost Family was also a target pick and received starred reviews from four trades, all four trades, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Library Journal. Jenna is the author of the audio course, The Writer at Work, The Art of Writing Fiction. Her work has been translated into more than 20 languages. Jenna is based in Boston where she teaches master novel and marketing workshops for Grub Street writers where she has been an instructor for over 20 years. Jenna earned her bachelor's in English at Kenyon College and her master's in creative writing at BU. Jenna is a professional public speaker traveling nationally and internationally to speak at universities, libraries, events, and book clubs. For her book, Those Who Save Us, Jenna visited over 800 book clubs in the Boston area alone. So maybe someone here tonight's seen her before. Uh, Jenna has written a screenplay for Those Who Save Us currently under option. Uh, she's just finished her first memoir about her Black Lab Woodrow and is working on her fourth novel. Please join me in welcoming to the virtual Pollard Memorial Library, Jenna Bloom. 
Thank you, Jamie. That was such a, I have to live up to my own introduction. It's always a little bit daunting. Um, I really appreciate it. I so wish that I could be here uh, with you all in person tonight at the library, which looks so beautiful, but I think it's amazing that Jamie has mastered the virtual background so that we can at least all appreciate its beauty on a screen. And I'm especially honored to be the library's first virtual event. The company that I started since COVID, A Mighty Blaze, I started sort of accidentally, but it connects writers with readers in the age of COVID. And we do virtual events pretty much 24-7. Um, but there's something like super special about being able to connect with readers this way. And although we miss out on that in-person connection, what I hope to do for you all tonight is to show you a little bit about how the sausage gets made, so to speak. So since I'm in my natural habitat in my apartment, I can show you, obviously, this is my, my library with my giant ego wall behind me. I have very high ceilings in this place in, in the back bay um, with all of my book covers. But I'll also walk you into my kitchen where I kitchen tested recipes for my third novel, um, The Lost Family. Um, and also I can take you into my study and show you where the real work gets done before I come out and like put on lipstick and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to giving you this sort of inside peek on the blaze, we call it the lifestyles of the lit and famous, the lit being like literary. So um, I'm really happy to walk you guys through what this, what it actually looks like. <laughs> it's not totally glamorous, but hopefully it will be fun. I'm also going to encourage you to ask all the questions that you ever wanted to ask a writer, but were afraid to ask. So you can ask me questions about the lost family, about those who save us, about the storm chasers, about other people's books. Um, about life, like if I don't know the answers, I just make them up because I'm a fiction writer and that's what I do. But I encourage you at any point to pop them into the chat and I will keep one eyeball on the chat and keep the other eyeball on you guys um, to see the questions as they come up and then I'll get to them as, as quickly as I can. I am not gonna talk at you for a really long time because my theory about this is TED Talks are 14 minutes long for a reason and those are the most inspired speakers on the planet and I ain't no TED Talk person. So what I would love to do is tell you a little bit about the Lost Family. My agent who's French says, always get your product placement in there. So here is my product placement. Um, I'm gonna tell you what the book is about for those of you who haven't read it yet. Um, how I came to write it and why. Um, and then um, depending on our time, I might read you a tiny bit of it because I always love to hear authors read from their own work, but I would much rather hear what you have to say. So if we're running short on time, I'll, I'll walk you around my home and then take your questions instead. So I'm gonna switch to gallery view for a second so that I have the joy of seeing this. You're, it's so amazing that you guys are giving me the privilege of your time as they say on NBC Nightly News. Like, Thank you for the privilege of your time. I'm so glad to see all your faces. How many of you have read The Lost Family so far? Okay, so on screen one, like half. On screen two, a gentleman on the beach, a <laughs> gentleman who laid down on a beach, took the book on vacation. So screen two, you guys need to do your homework a little bit more. Um, but the reason I ask this question is not to book shame you guys. It's so um, I know like who I'm putting to sleep when I'm giving you like the thumbnail of, of what the book is about. So for those of you who have not read The Lost Family, it's my third novel. And it's about a German Jewish concentration camp survivor named Peter Rashkin, who survives two camps, Theresienstadt and Auschwitz, emigrates to the States, to New York, where he starts a restaurant on the Upper East Side in the um, 1960s called Masha's, um, and then falls in love with a young model named June Bouquet. And that is really her name. She is an emigrant from the Midwest where her last name is pronounced Bucket. And Peter is entranced by June, who at the time is wearing like a micro mini skirt and very high go-go boots um, every day as part of like her job description. And they fall in love and they have a courtship. And when they marry, which is not a spoiler because it's actually on the book jacket, um, they discover that Peter is still haunted by the family, a wife and two daughters he lost during the war in Europe. So the novel is from Peter's point of view and June's point of view, and then their daughter Elsbeth's point of view as well. So it follows the whole family through this process of three decades worth of discovery that the history is not done with Peter yet. 
The number one question on the board for any writer at any writer event is, why did you write this novel? Um, so I'm going to answer that question to forestall you asking it. The Lost Family was inspired by a gentleman I interviewed for the Steven Spielberg Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. I worked for the foundation for four years in the late 90s interviewing Holocaust survivors. I interviewed over five dozen survivors, so about 60 Holocaust survivors over that four years. And another question I get asked quite a bit is, did you use any of those stories in your fiction? Because my first book is also about the Holocaust era. And my answer is no, vehemently no. I don't believe in using survivors' stories for my own. I believe that their testimony and their memories are hollowed ground, um, and therefore I respect that as a very strong boundary. But I will say that Peter's story in The Lost Family was inspired by actual events, as they say on TV, um, that um, I interviewed a gentleman who, like Peter, was a chef. Unlike Peter, who in the novel is at first an aspiring chef and then a restaurateur, this gentleman, the real survivor, was very famous in his native country of Czechoslovakia before the Nazis came. He was like the Anthony Bourdain of Prague. And he had a whole restaurant empire um, and was very well revered. When the Nazis came, of course, they first shut down his restaurants, took away his empire, and over a couple of years, put him in several camps including Theresienstadt and Auschwitz. He outlasted them all, came to the States where the only job he could get was as a busboy. And then he was fired from that job as a busboy because his Auschwitz tattoo, like the tattoo on his arm, upset the diners in the restaurant where he was working. So the story that the survivor told me about this, he tossed off sort of anecdotally toward the end of his, I want to say three hour testimony, compared to some of the other things he had described that he had seen in the camps, it really wasn't that bad. But the story about being fired from your job as a busboy because of your tattoo stuck with me as this cruel little irony of having survived the unimaginable made it to what you thought was a safe place and then still finding yourself imprisoned emotionally by not being able to share with people what had happened to you and not being able to explain it to anybody. And so over the years, that story acted as a sort of a screw in my head that kept tightening and tightening and making me think about what it would really be like um, to be a refugee, which is a part of the testimonies that we used to go through I to say pretty fast. Like we spent a lot of time focusing on survivors pre-war years because in many cases their towns, their histories, their homes, had, their families had been wiped out. So they were the only witnesses to say that they had ever existed. And we spent a lot of time focusing on the details of the war years because it was a history preservation project. But when it came to the refugee years, we survivors said, then we came to the States, I came here from the joint, I met my wife, I learned English from watching TV. And I think as an interviewer, even I felt like roll credits, they came to the States, everything is fine, you know, we'll just hand out Studebakers and, and everybody has a happy life in the suburbs. But hearing that story made me think maybe that's not true. So I started trying to imagine what it would be like to be a young man, so in your late teens or early 20s, having lost everything you knew and everyone you loved, your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your grandparents, your friends, whole generations wiped out, and having to come to a country where you knew nobody and didn't speak the language and had to start all over again while you were carrying this emotional weight around. What would that be like? So I started doing what I always do when I start a book, which was writing short stories about Peter's experience of test driving some scenes for him. And while I was doing this, I went to a reading in Florida. I used to travel nationally and internationally to talk about my books, and now I do that by Zoom. But this is an, a real life event where they had really excellent cookies. And after I you know, fueled myself up on a lot of cookies and coffee, um, I got up at the podium and talked about what I was working on. And somebody said, what are you working on next? And I told the audience about Peter's story and the refugee experience I was intent on exploring. 
And afterwards in the signing line, a woman came up to me and she had tears in her eyes and she said, I'm so glad you're writing about this man. It's so important to preserve all of the memories, the full spectrum of memories, but I implore you to please think about his family. She said, my husband is the son of a survivor and we revere my father-in-law. We love him, but he's totally locked down when it comes to his wartime experiences and he's totally shut down emotionally and he will not talk about it to anyone. And my husband has suffered his whole life from not being able to connect with his father. So please write about the families. And I felt as though the universe were giving me a little God wink through this lady because I had already started doing just that. I was writing um, little pieces from the point of view of Peter's American wife, June, who is a child of the Midwest, who's born in the 1940s to a single mom and a dad she never met because he was killed at Iwo Jima, um, and about Peter and June's daughter, Elsbeth, and what it's like to be the daughter of a man who you love so much. A daddy's girl is what Elspeth is, which is what I was too. Um, but unlike me, she would often come upon Peter looking sad and know that every time she saw him looking into the middle distance um, with this unfathomable expression of loss, he was remembering the two sisters she had who died during the war. So what kind of emotional effect does that have on a second wife? What kind of emotional effect does it have on a daughter? And so The Lost Family grew from being a book about how one person survives trauma and rebuilds in the aftermath or tries to, to being about how a whole family puts its arms around trauma. Um, and what do you do um, when the person you love most in the whole world is locked to you? And how do you sort of shoot off in your own directions and find love in your life in other ways? So. Believe it or not, that's the short answer to the question of what the lost family is about and how I came to write it. And you're now forewarned that I'm not capable of really giving short answers. Um, but if you're still brave enough to answer, uh, enter questions in the chat, I will be happy to take them. Um, I do have a question from Anissa, who I think I know from The Blaze. And this is like our, our number one reader and viewer at The Blaze. Like she is at all the events. She's like my favorite cheerleader. So thank you for being here. She is asking me, what book is my favorite book to write and why? Great question. So again, I'm going to show you guys like my ego wall behind me here. Um, all of my book covers are up like right behind my head is Those Who Save Us, which is my first novel. And then The Storm Chasers is up on that top shelf. Um, and then The Lost Family, which being the baby has only four or five foreign editions. The other books have like 15 or 16 foreign editions, which is a hoot. Um, I guess, I mean, my first book, Those Who Save Us, is my favorite, was my favorite book to write because um, the experience of writing each book has been very different. Those Who Save Us, I was full of this burning zeal that I've had since I was four years old to make it as a writer. And I was 29 when I started writing that novel. And I remember saying to my mom at that point, you know, this book is the best I can do. And if I don't make it with this book, then I'm gonna move to Nebraska and become a truck stop waitress. Like this is, you know, this is it, it's my final shot. I'm sure I would have kept writing like even as a truck stop waitress, but um, I, I really thought I'm, I'm giving it my best shot here. And so I was really full of passion for that book. I wrote it in this very, almost clandestine way. I was teaching at Boston University then as a four class adjunct um, and teaching at Grub Street Writers where I still teach. And so I had five full-time classes and I was teaching by day and then writing by night. So I would come home from my teaching jobs, do you know real life stuff like pay the mortgage and then write from 10 at night to four in the morning. Um, and then I would get up at eight o'clock to teach my morning classes and then start the process all over again. And um, so really I did that for three years. I left the house only to teach classes and like go out once a week with my friends. And I compare the process of writing that first novel to like 
giving birth in the shack in the woods and like screaming and not knowing if anybody is there to hear you or help you when the baby comes out. Um, but you're doing it on your own and you feel really strong about it. And then the second and the third books, because of the success of the first book, which I'm you know, so grateful for, um, I had a whole team of midwives looking over my shoulder and monitoring the baby's heartbeat and saying, when is the book coming out? When is the book coming out? How are you doing? So um, I much prefer kind of doing it on my own. And so I liked writing those who save us the best because I had nobody looking over my shoulder. So that's the answer to that question. And Nissa, thank you so much. Um, 0576, who's obviously like a James Bond character, wants to know, will the books be signed? Author copies, having the, standing in line to have the book signed at the event is a great part of the experience. I know it's actually, aside from questions, my favorite part. I love to talk to readers and I also love to hear reader stories because the novels act as a sort of lightning rod. And I'm greatly privileged to hear people tell me their stories of like their parents who fought in World War II or people they had known who fought in World War II or people who were hidden or were survivors. And I really, really miss that. So I'm sorry, you guys. And I also always bring cookies. So I'm sorry I can't bring you any cookies. Um, but I will happily send book plates to the library if you like. And then um, you can get the book plates from from the library and tuck them into your, your actual print copies or just, you know, feature them prominently on your refrigerator if you're reading on a, on a Kindle. So thank you for that question. Um, Mary, Marlene, thank you. Somebody has asked, Karen Davidson Heller has asked, um, how did I do the research for those who save us? I loved the book. Thank you so much. That's so kind. I should probably just get up and like take that first baby down from the shelf and do my game show hostess thing and, and show you what we're talking about here. So this. So this is my first baby. Here she is in hardcover which is like, um, I don't know if you can see the sort of ghosty faces on the cover, but um, this was not a popular cover because shockingly people going to the beach had a hard time thinking about bringing Auschwitz with them to the beach. And I remember going on book tour as a, as a baby author, like a baby debut author and having booksellers say to me, you know, we love this book. We love the story. Um, we are having a hard time selling it because of the cover. And so when the book came out in paperback, voila, this is the cover that probably a lot of you have seen if you've read this novel. And um, it led to a spate of novels about World War II that have read on the cover in some way because what they wanted to do is evoke the Holocaust experience without freaking people out. Um, and so they put a little girl in a red coat, I think to evoke the little girl in Schindler's List. And so a lot of the World War II book covers you see now, um, are modeled after this cover, which became totally iconic. Um, and I had nothing to do with it, except I just loved it when I got it in my hands. So um, how many of you have read Those Who Save Us? I'm gonna switch back to gallery view. Okay, so screen one, like Sam, you're gonna go to screen two, let's see screen two. Um, if you've read Those Who Save Us, put your hands in the air, like you just don't care about World War II fiction. All right, good, so awesome, thank you. So those who save us, how did I do the research? Um, I went to Germany three times with my mom, um, which was arguably scarier than the research I did for my second book, which was to go storm chasing, chasing tornadoes for eight years <laughs> with a professional storm for company. Um, and I read everything I could find about the Holocaust, which you can imagine took me like 10 years and I'm not kidding. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna turn around and show you my Holocaust shelf so you can see what I'm talking about like my library up here all of the books I don't even know if you can see them like all of those books going up to the ceiling are all my Holocaust library so I amassed like this giant library of Holocaust era books including um, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich which is the bible for um, Holocaust scholars and is like 1100 pages long um, and a book called Who's Who in Nazi Germany that I had on the mantle in my then apartment that scared everybody who came to visit me. I listened to German music from the era. I watched German movies from the era, including all of the Leni Reifenstahl Nazi propaganda films. Um, I took German classes at which I was a miserable failure. 
I baked everything that appears in Those Who Save Us, which is no small feat, as the novel is set half in a bakery in Germany. Um, and for a brief period of insanity, I also dressed like the characters. I do this with every book. Um, which is always fun for historical fiction. But every night when I sat down to write at 10 in the evening, I would put on this like German dirndl skirt and this white puffy sleeve shirt and clogs. And I had my hair in two braids and I would sit down and try to channel my main character, Anna. And I'm, I'm so sorry, I should have given you a thumbnail. The book is about a woman who becomes the mistress of an SS officer from Buchenwald to save herself and her little daughter when she's caught working in the resistance and then the daughter's quest 50 years later to find out what the mom has done because the mom will never talk about it. So I was dressing like the German mom who works in a bakery. And so for five years while I was writing this book, I had an excellent um, Halloween costume as a, a German baker, um, but I only wore that in the house except for Halloween. So that's kind of the short answer of how I do my research, which one reader called method research, which was, I thought, quite kind, and other readers have called craziness, which is probably a little more accurate. I like to start by reading. I always go to the library to research my books. I try to get into the setting of the books in real life. So um, for the first and third books, I went to Germany. For the second book, I went to the Midwest. Um, and I uh, always try to recreate as much as I can the physical experience of being my characters so that I can turn that inside out in the pages and replicate it for you, the readers, so that the book is so replete with detail that it becomes a world that when you read, you walk into it and spend time there and hopefully you walk out of it with, with memories of that world and even dreams of that world. So that's why I do such an intensive research process. It's almost like living an alternate, an alternate life. You guys are asking great questions. Please keep it up. I, I love answering the questions. They've been very polite so far. So I'm encouraging you to, you know, throw some other stuff at me that you might feel is a little bit less so or in a nice intimate forum. Um, have my books been published in Germany and how were they received? Great question. My agent tried for 10 years to sell Those Who Save Us in Germany, which you would think would have been an easy sell because it is about a German woman and it's told from her point of view. So it was actually fairly empathic to the German civilian. And yet my agent kept getting blocked by German publishers and, say, and they would say, why is an American woman writing about the German experience during World War II? Like we have enough on our plates to deal with. So my agent would go every year to the Frankfurt Book Fair, try to sell those who save us, and then come back to me and she would say, uh, Jenna, I am so sorry, but again, we did not sell to Germany this year, but we will be like the ally and we will surround Germany, sell to all the countries around Germany, and eventually we will, we will win, we will triumph. And she was right, because she did finally sell it on like the 11th year. Let me see if I can find, where is it? Yep. So, this is what it's called in German, Die uns leben. Uh, I told you I was bad at, at German, um, which means those who love us instead of those who save us, which I thought was really interesting that there was a sort of a different take on it. Um, the Storm Chasers also was sold in Germany um, and the Lost Family was sold in Germany. I'm going to show you like my favorite poster I have in my apartment for it. It is called in German, can you see this? Die Himmel über Manhattan, which means the sky over Manhattan. And this is the cover for it, which shows Peter's wife, June, sitting on a dock looking at New York. So that's the German cover of The Lost Family. And I have to say, I totally loved this. And it's such a treat to see all of the different covers. I just, I get such a kick out of it. I never know what they're going to look like until they show up in my inbox as email. Um, and I think the reaction from German people has been very kind, actually. Germany is a country that has been reckoning with its conscience for over 60 years. And um, since I first went there in 1993 with my mom um, and returned in 2017, I saw the most incredible transformation. When I went in 93, there was no uh, memorial to Buchenwald. There was no sign at Nuremberg that anything had ever happened there. In 93, the famous rally field where um, Hitler had his giant rallies um, in Nuremberg was a racetrack. 
complete with like NASCAR symbols and Coca-Cola signs. When I went back in 2017, there's an excellent museum and everything had been completely memorialized. So I think that Germans tend to be fairly receptive to um, books that help them grapple with the events that happened, um, even two generations before the current, current crop if you will, was born. And so the response I've gotten from German readers has always been, thank you, like, thanks very much for, for writing this and contributing to this literature. So how are you guys all doing? I'm gonna like scroll through and see if anybody is actively asleep. If we were there in person, I could be like, you wake you all up, but no, nobody is sleeping. I'm happy. Thank you for being awake. Good. Um, so I'll answer and, uh, some more questions and please keep them coming. Rosemary has asked, you mentioned interviewing survivors. Shortly that generation will pass and what will be lost to authors in the future? That is a great question. And it's something that um, the women I know, especially, but the men too, I mostly know women who write, um, who write about World War II fiction one of the reasons I think we do this is we're very, very conscious of the fact that that generation is, is aging out and that those in-person memories will be lost to us. Um, and obviously we're showing even now that we're not very good at remembering or learning from our history. My theory about this now is that once you're two generations removed from any cataclysm, it's so remote that it seems like it just isn't really real and you don't need to pay attention to it. So I feel personally a very strong moral obligation to keep telling these stories. One of the things my survivors almost always uniformly said at the end of every interview when we asked them, what would you like the world to know about what you went through? The answer was almost always, the world should know what we went through so it will never happen again. And so I feel having had the great privilege of speaking in person to survivors that it's incumbent upon me to keep telling these stories. And I know a lot of novelists feel the same way and a lot of authors feel the same way. I guess, um, I mean, what will be lost is that in-person eyewitness experience um, which is something that is increasingly valuable in a world in which information itself is so bifurcated and can be so easily manufactured. Um, so it's really important to have those experiences. On the positive side, the USC Shoah Foundation, whom I interviewed for, is, has put together the most incredible thing. This was on a CBS 60 Minutes recently, so if you go look, you can find it. They interviewed survivors, I think six survivors, and then um, asked them about their experiences so much that they've actually created holograms of those survivors. And the survivors can answer questions even though now some of them have passed away. Like the, the foundation spent so much time with them that they were able to capture every single response that they might have had. So you can go pull up a hologram of one of these survivors and say, what was it like for you the day that you arrived in Mauthausen? And the survivor will say, when I first got there, it was rainy and you know, I lost sight of my brother and, and tell their stories. And it, it's asked everything from factual information to, do you still believe in God? And the holograms will answer those questions. So I think that although of course, it's a little bit like this, right? Like nothing is as good as in-person experience, but thank God for technology because it helps us bridge some of our gulfs. Um, so things will be irreparably lost, but we're also able to preserve more than we used to. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, oh my gosh, so many great questions. Um, oh my gosh. Jamie has asked me a great question about the blaze, which I'll save probably for the end. Um, Sean Fibido said, what, and forgive me if I'm butchering name pronunciation, because I love to do that. What inspired me to start writing? Who are your influences then and now? And what sort of reading do you reach to for comfort? I love what delicious questions. Um, my dad inspired me to start writing. My dad was a newsman. He wrote for CBS for Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather and Harry Reasoner, which is why Walter makes a little cameo in the opening pages of The Lost Family. I knew him as Uncle Walter. Um, and I will tell you a story about this if you want. Um, when I was a little girl, I had a stuffed animal named Henry, a dog who I used to carry around with me everywhere. And my dad used to like to take me to the newsroom and like show me off and, you know, let me come to work with him. And one day I left Henry in the CBS newsroom and I was about six, I think. I was 
inconsolable. I mean, I, I would not sleep or eat. I couldn't stop crying. Um, and so in the middle of me pitching this big fit, there was a knock at the back door in our house in Montclair, New Jersey, where I grew up. And I opened the back door to see Walter Cronkite standing there and he had my Henry in his hand and Henry had a little um, yellow paper hat that said CBS on it that Walter had put. And meanwhile, I, I was so happy to see my Henry. I could not understand why my mom, who was making like hamburger helper behind me was flipping the freak out because <laughs> Walter Cronkite was standing in our kitchen in New Jersey. And I was like, what is wrong with her? I got Henry back, like who cares? So that's how close he was to my family. Um, my dad's background in journalism was really inspiring. I grew up listening to the sound of his typewriter and like how many of you remember what a typewriter is like please tell me you do um when i speak at universities i have to say it's not just an app invented by tom hanks it's like an actual machine that we used to have to use to make you know stories and um i always wanted to grow up to be a writer like my dad so i first started writing when i was four years old and wrote stories about mermaids and princesses i illustrated them they were fantastic as you can imagine and I um, won the 17 fiction magazine, 17 magazine fiction contest when I was 14, and then again when I was 16. So I decided the world of me a living as a writer. So I went to Kenyon College, got a degree in English, graduated, and found out that the world of me a living in food service, which is what I then did for the next 20 years with my BA in English, while I kept writing stories and trying to get them published. But the reason I, I give you this sort of background is that my parents never gave up on me. They always supported me. They always encouraged me. They never said to me, Jen, when are you going to get a real job? My dad used to slip me money on the sly. You know, like when my car um, engine gave out on the highway, like he bought me another old beater car so I could get to work. And um, after he passed, which was in 1999, I was going through his papers in his study and I found one of my old stories that um, was written about a mermaid or a princess. And at the top in my dad's handwriting in his like spidery, spiky little handwriting, it said, hey, Walt, look, this kid's a genius. So my dad had saved all my stories and like bought them into the CBS newsroom to show Walter Cronkite. And that's the kind of support I had from my parents. Um, so if you know any creatives in your life, we often feel a little bit stupid because we're not making very good money and it's not like a consistent living. So please give them lots of support and encouragement. And if you can like slip them a little bit of food on the side or something. There were many years when I was really happy to have my dad send me like a $200 check so that I could, you know, go buy, keep myself in beer, you know. Um, my influences then and now, Stephen King is a big influence on my work, early Stephen King, not present Stephen King, but I think he's a great storyteller and really um, is very good with psychology, especially the portraiture of people under duress, which I love to write about, I love to read about. So when we start, first started hearing about the pandemic, of course, I went back and read all of my Stephen King, including The Stand, which is about a pandemic. Um, and so I'm not surprised by anybody's behavior now, even if people are acting atrociously. I'm like, eh, Stephen King already predicted this. And he also predicted the political situation in the dead zone. And, you know, so I feel like if you want a psychic writer, you can always turn to Stephen King. Um, he's, but he also was a great storyteller, especially the older stuff. Larry McMurtry, I love too. Um, Lonesome Dove, Terms of Endearment. I tend to like these big epic novels. Um, and my comfort food writers are Elizabeth Berg, like behind me, I have a whole shelf of Elizabeth Berg novels. She's a lovely, lovely woman and a, and, um, a friend, I'm proud to say, and I'm kind of humbled to say. Um, and also um, Belva Plain. I don't know if you guys remember Belva Plain, but she writes um, sort of like Jewish family sagas with this moral center in each one. And my mom, who is a great reader, and I used to love all the Belva books, especially this book called Random Winds, which was about a doctor who was in love with his wife's sister, like over the generations with all of these tragic results. And so every once in a while, my mom and I would just call each other up and be like, oh, Dr. Martin Farrell, <laughs> and then just sort of hang up. So um, when I want comfort, I go back to Belva, I go back to Elizabeth, I go to Nora Ephron, who always makes me laugh. Um, and then I, I kind of go to the big boys for ambition, you know, Philip Roth, Stephen King, um, William Styron. I kind of want to be William Styron, except not male, 
um, alcoholic and dead, but I aspire to write books with beautiful language that are about something important. And that was what he did. So I just totally love all of these questions. Okay, who else has questions for me? And have I missed any? I dare you, I double dog dare you to ask me some more questions. Um, Jenna, if you want, we can, oh, we, yeah. Okay, great. We can, actually folks, just uh, to um, see what you thought about when you read all the wonderful menus in The Lost Family. I've got <laughs> various copies of it here. Um, I put together a poll that I'm going to um, send out to you and, um, it's only a brief summary of some of the great descriptions of um, the items that you could have gotten at Masha's restaurant. I couldn't uh, write out all of the wonderful ingredients, but why don't you, yep, there, there is a page. There were two um, menus in the book. So I've sort of picked a few of the highlights. So I'll send out the poll, give you a minute to sort of pick a couple that you would love to have eaten um, and so we'll see what folks think. So I'm going to send out the poll now. I love the poll. And oh my God, this is so great. And it's also making me hungry. So <laughs> while you guys are taking the poll, and I, God, I just love that you did this, Belinda. Thank you. I'm going to screen grab this. It's amazing. So I will have you all know that I made up all the items on the menu. Peter's restaurant is an homage to his wife, Masha, whom he lost during the war, and Masha is German, and Peter is Jewish. So the menu is German Jewish comfort food, but with a 1965 twist, which means that everything was brown and saturated in whiskey. And I had the most wonderful time creating all of the menu items, like a whole summer's worth of procrastination um, and kitchen testing them myself. So I made all of the things, um, rabbit stew I actually did make, which was not my favorite Brussels sprout salad from, I was at my house in Minnesota where I have a family home and I made them from my, uh, got Brussels sprouts from my garden, plum tart I made with plums from my tree, um, kirsch I drank, you know, for inspiration. Um, and I made a lot of the dishes here too in my apartment in Boston. So I'm gonna walk you guys in there so you can see my little furnace room. And then I'll walk you into this study while you're taking the poll. I think this is good timing because now you can go all eat afterwards, right? If you want to, if you get hungry, but here's my kitchen. Um, and this is my big chalkboard in my kitchen. My dog sitter, when I came home from book tour had had a, um, a chalk artist come in and draw the lost family on my big chalkboard in my kitchen, which was so nice. Um, and I've kept it there ever since, but like, this is it. My kitchen is tiny. As you can see, it's a real city kitchen. Like here are all my cookbooks. My, my cookbooks that my mom gave me are all up on top of the cupboards. Um, and every time I start to feel sorry for myself about what a tiny, tiny kitchen I have, I think that in New York, there would be a kitchen half this size in a restaurant with 16 more people in it making these world-class dishes. So I have made some crazy stuff in this kitchen, y'all, including all of the menu items that you see. And my favorite one to make probably is the Masha Tort, which is an inside out German chocolate cake with cherry flambe because I love to light it on fire. So I have set many fires in this apartment. Um, I'm also gonna walk you into my study so you can see where I make a different kind of sausage, which is the literary sausage. Like this is where I work. Um, here are the uh, foreign editions for my books. Like another sort of ego shelf in here. Um, and behind me, I have all my research for the Lost Family is in this room in the study. And I'm gonna maybe pull down a couple of the um, cookbooks to show you because I used my, my mom's and my grandmother's cookbooks. But I'm gonna show you what my books look like when they're in progress. So I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but this is what I call book on a wall. And this is what my books look like when I'm writing them. Um, I make outlines. People often ask, do you write from an outline? I do write from an outline because I find it helpful to have a chart of where I'm going. It never remains the same. It's kind of the same thing as taking a road trip with a map. And of course you deviate from the map and the fun is in like the places that you go that you don't expect. But I don't like to set off on a road trip without a map. So this is my map. Um, you can see like the post-it notes 
um, and all the little tabs. And a lot of them are like actual lines that will appear in the book and I put them next to the chapters that they will appear in. So that's one of the books. This whole blank area is where my memoir, Woodrow on the Bench about my dog was. And then I finished that and turned it into my agent who's now reading it. Um, and therefore um, I took all those notes down, which was super satisfying. And then this is a prequel sequel to The Lost Family. So um, I had started writing this maybe two or three years ago and was making all the notes about it. Like you can see some stuff is really detailed. Some of it is just, you know, handwritten lines that have occurred to me. Um, but I got a little bit sidetracked from writing that novel because I really wanted to write about my dog's last months of life when he was not mobile and how I sat on a bench with him across from my apartment for seven months and then what that taught me. Like as somebody who is really traveling around all the time and always busy to be forced to sit still it was very anomalous um, and it actually was one of the best things I ever did. So I credit my, my very old dog with teaching me some great life lessons and the memoir, which is called Woodrow on the Bench. It's kind of like Tuesdays with Maury, except all the lessons come from this very elegant old black lab. So um, that's where I wrote that. And I'm going to show you, hopefully you're not getting too bored yet, but um, here's one of the books that I used when I was writing The Lost Family, the Betty Crocker New Picture Cookbook, which is one of my favorite things to cook from in the whole world, best pie crust ever. Um, and lots of handy advice for women, especially like wives. When your husbands come home from work, you should greet them at the door um, with a smile and a glass of fruit glass of vegetable juice, preferably chilled because he's had a hard day. So. Yeah, take notes on that. Um, and then I had all of the gourmet magazines from 1965, which I got from eBay, beautifully bound. So I thought it was just a stack of magazines and then this fantastic freaking book showed up at my apartment. So I got to use that. That was a joy. And people would send me these fantastic things like favorite restaurants and favorite recipes of New England um, from like 1963. So I had such a delicious time when I was researching Masha's in the Lost Family, just reading cookbooks every morning and plotting out and planning my recipes and then um, eating them and especially eating all the failures. Like that was my favorite part of researching that book. So cool. So maybe I'll share our results. And so yes. <laughs> I'll love that. Here. Thank you. Look at this, very nice. Who's hungry? I'm kind of hungry. So does the 41% want roast chicken with beach plum and cranberry plum serve? That is an excellent choice. Although personally, I have to say you guys are missing out on the brisket Wellington, which is amazing. I love that hamburger Walter got no veg got 7% hamburger Walter with no vegetables. Um, would you like to hear the, the story about the hamburger Walter? So Hamburger Walter is, of course, an homage to Walter Cronkite. Um, and um, my dad used to go eat dinner with Walter sometimes after a broadcast, but only if Walter's wife was out of town because they had a very close marriage. And usually after every broadcast, he would go home to their apartment on the Upper East Side and have dinner with Betty um, and just have a lovely evening together. But when Betty was out of town, um, Walter and my dad and the other writers would go to PJ Clark's and get whiskey and burgers. And Walter apparently would say, um, well, this is the privilege of being happy bachelors is that you get to have hamburgers with no vegetables at all. So <laughs> that's why I put that in the, on the menu. Um, it's pretty yummy, but I'm with you. I'm with you roasted duck people. Wellington is good. Um, plum tart is excellent. And when we can all get together again in person, I would love to like have a dinner party with everybody and have these luscious, luscious foods. So I will cook. I'm a good cook. Very yum. What a fun thing, Belinda. Thank you so much. I love it. So Anissa has asked, when do we get to read Woodrow's book? Um, we can, I don't know when it gets published, I guess. My agent is reading it now. Um, and like many people, she's having a hard time reading during COVID, which is kind of a problem because it's her job to read. So she has promised to get me my feedback by the middle of September, which is like tomorrow. And then I will revise it. She'll send it to my editor. Um, and if my editor wants to publish it, then 
it should be out probably, I guess, in about a year, I want to say. That's usually how long it takes to alchemize a book from a manuscript into a book. But because it's a memoir, it will probably take less time than a novel. Like novels generally in invite a lot of revision. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll see Woodrow out within a year. That would be amazing. So everybody, please, you know, knock on wood or knock, this is my knocking on wood or, you know, clap to keep Tinkerbell alive or whatever um, for that book to come out soon. Because I would love to share it with everybody. Um, Belinda wants to know, do I have a favorite character from one of my books? Probably Woodrow, I gotta say. But um, I think the characters who are um, the most major chords to me emotionally, like the people who strike the heaviest emotional chords for me are um, Anna from Those Who Save Us, the German woman who becomes the mistress of the SS officer, and then Peter from The Lost Family. And the reason is Anna um, is so much her own person. Like she came into my head when I was visiting Buchenwald in 1993 with my mom. And I suddenly, I asked my mom if you had been alive during World War II and lived in Weimar, which is so close to Buchenwald, and you were a native born German, what would you have done if you knew what was happening you know, up in the camp? Um, and my mom at that point said, um, I don't know what I would have done. I would like to think that I would have been brave enough to help my Jewish neighbors and friends by hiding them or feeding them or getting them out of the country. But if the Nazis caught you, they would kill you. It was not a hypothetical and it was not a game. They would kill you and they would kill your children. So I don't know if I would have been brave enough. I can only hope I would have been brave enough. And that was when the character of Anna came into my head and she felt like an entirely separate person from me, which was so magical. She felt like her own presence, her own personality, just this young, beautiful German woman who was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time and was forced by history to make what Holocaust scholars now call the choiceless choice. Um, so Anna is somebody who stays with me uh, as a very strong emotional presence. And Peter is just not done with me yet. Like I, I love writing about this dude. So every time I think I'm done with him, he's like, Ah, no, you know, like there's a story about me when I was 20 and here's a story about me when I was 85. And so the book on the wall that I just showed you, that's the prequel sequel to Lost Family, is about Peter's young life in Germany as um, the Nazis are coming to power and yet he is marrying and having these two um, little girls. Um, and then Peter's life as a much older American immigrant um, and he's forced to go back to the to Germany um, for the first time in 50 years. And then he finds out that nothing about that young life is what he thought it was at all. Um, so he has to sort of question his own origin story. And so, you know, Peter is not done with me yet. He's, he persists like Elizabeth Warren, like he's, he's very persistent. Um, what do I hope readers take away from the lost family? Thank you, Sean, that's a great question. I hope readers take away that one, we are always in danger, no matter how good-hearted we are, of turning into a uh, totalitarian state. Um, because what I wanted to show with Peter and what I'm exploring more in that prequel sequel is how you can have a country full of essentially good-hearted people um, and yet um, find yourself going down that very slippery slope into the unimaginable. So that's something that I want people to be very aware of in that novel. And the novel shows what it does to a family 20 years later and an entire ocean away. So people's actions have very long tails and I want readers to be aware of that. On a less heavy level and a, a warmer level, I want readers to feel the way I feel when I finish a great book that I've loved. Like when I finish a book I, I love reading, I kiss it <laughs> and I say thank you to it. Like I hug it and I say thank you for the experience of this book. And I feel as though the characters in the book become my friends, like they're real people who I then kind of walk through the world with. And every once in a while, you know, I remember a detail from a book and I, it's as though I lived it. I think about what would this character do in this situation? So it's as though I know them. And that's what I hope for, uh, for the Lost Family and the Storm Chasers and those who save us, that those of you who read those books, I hope that you feel my characters walking with you when the book is done. And it helps you feel, if you ever feel alone, less alone. So I think that's what fiction should do. Like it, it holds out a hand to people um, across our, our human differences and says like, you're not alone in this thought, in this action, um, in this behavior. Um, I'm there too, I'm with you. So that's what I, that's what I hope for. Um, 
I think I have time and Belinda, you tell me or Jamie, tell me like, you know, with your gong, I, I think I have time for a couple of more questions, maybe like two. Yeah, it sounds great. A couple more. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And thank you, um, Karen Davidson Hiller said, Anna has stayed with her for years. Me too, lady. Me too. She is, she's still there. My mom used to say of Anna, she used to say, Anna is so real, which was like my mom's favorite, you know, the highest accolade that she could pay a, a character. And I think so too. And what made her so magic to me is that she's not me. She just is somebody who is in my head. And so I felt very honored that she kind of chose me to, to channel through. So thank you for saying that. Um, what is my greatest learning from my research for these books? Angel, what a beautiful name, has asked. I guess, what is my greatest learning from research? You guys are asking great questions. Um, I guess, again, and I don't, I hesitate always to infuse Meet the Author Evenings with politics, but um, I feel as though like I'm hitting, I've been hitting a gong for a really long time and using a megaphone for a really long time, like just saying like, we have to be really careful, like the things that we do matter. Um, and I feel as though, especially like my background in Holocaust studies and, and Nazi Germany and the rise of Nazi Germany is, is quite alarming to me. And we're seeing a lot of right wing stuff happening across the globe right now. It's not just in our own country. And um, so I find myself for in an almost constant state of alarm. So I think that all of my research from book research to actually talking to survivors and hearing their stories firsthand and hearing from them how their lives started, as one of my survivors said, things happen first very slowly and then so quickly you can't imagine it. Um, all of that learning has lodged in me. And so when I look around at where we are now, I, I live in a sort of constant low grade terror. I mean, I know that many of us do, but the, the um, accompaniment to that is that um, I feel very strongly that if I see something that's wrong, I must call it out. And that gives me a sense of purpose and a sense of hope to say like, I think this is wrong. I'm going to try to fix it. Here I am, like who's with me. Um, and so I think the research has also taught me the importance of a call to action and of taking action in whatever way you can, when, especially when you feel scared or powerless. I think that's really important. And that is what um, a lot of the, the research taught me. Um, also, not to um, throw ice cubes in a gas oven when you're making baguettes like Julia Child because you will extinguish the pilot light and your kitchen will fill up with gas and you have to call the gas company. So just be careful of that. Um, was there any concept that I wasn't able to develop that I wish I could have included in my books? Um, oh my gosh, so many. So I have many, many scenes from all the novels that I have axed because they didn't fit the novel's final shape. Um, and I include them as outtakes, um, like sort of director's cut outtakes on my website. So if you love one of the characters and miss the character when the book is over, like I do as a reader, you know, I, I miss characters and I think I would just love to hang out with Aurora Greenway and see her brushing her teeth. Like I just really miss her. I, I miss Scarlett O'Hara. I miss, you know, I miss all these people. Um, I put the outtakes on my website for that reason, so you can go hang out with my characters a little bit. Um, and finally, um, Jamie had asked me a question a ways back about um, how authors are adapting to the current environment that we live in, which is Zoom world, like Zoomlandia. And I have to say, at first, it was really hard. In March, um, I love nothing more than to meet readers and speak to people. Like I would drive over a pedestrian to get to a microphone, like a legit microphone. Like I really love meeting people. And there was one day when I watched all of my events get canceled, 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 kind of like um, the board at Penn Central, uh, Grand Central Station, the train board, when it would just roll over and over and over, all the events just flipped to canceled, canceled, canceled. And that was bad for me personally, because I love meeting readers. But The Lost Family is already safely out in the hands of readers. What was really devastating to me was knowing about my friends. I have so many novelist friends who spend three years, five years, 10 years researching and writing a novel and knowing that because those novels were being released into a pandemic, they would not be able to go out and meet people and then the novels might just poof, disappear and get extinguished. And I am a person who, when I get mad about something, I take action about it. 
Um, I have a megaphone and a backup megaphone. And in this case, I thought, you know what? I'm just not going to let that happen. Like, I really want to connect my friends with the readers who are waiting for good books. So I started with my friend Caroline Levitt, who's a New York Times bestselling novelist. Also, um, this company called A Mighty Blaze. And we we put up a Facebook page every Tuesday when books come out. So today is like a new, pub a new publishing day, new book day. Um, I would just put all the books up on this Facebook page and say, readers, come on over here and check them out. And then we started doing that every Tuesday. And then we started doing an, a bookstore Wednesday. And then we started doing celebrity author conversations on Thursday. And then we started doing these legendary author interviews on Friday. So I started talking to John Irving and Cheryl Strayed and Anna Quinlan and Pam Houston. And um, who am I talking to? Uh, we're still trying to get Margaret Atwood. Like she's very elusive. But and Stephen King. Like Caroline has a campaign to get Stephen King. But what has happened is like there's this whole community of writers and readers. And I think it it basically speaks to not only a mighty blaze like stepping in to fill a need, but the fact that the writing community is very strong. Like you guys know this as readers. You know it as patrons of a beautiful library. A library is not just a place where you get books. It is the nucleus of a community. It's where you go to feel in the company of other people who love books, as well as the sort of palpable chemistry of characters. So when that is not there in real life, we have this. And it's not the same, but in many ways, it's really magical. Like I would not have been able to show you my study if I were in the beautiful library. So. I have watched authors adapt to this and I have seen so much support from the reading community and I, I applaud you all for making that switch um, and pivoting and being brave about it because I know sometimes it's really hard and daunting to do the technology um, and I invite you all to um, check out the blaze on social media and come and see me and come and see all the writers like showing off and doing our thing and to really to learn about new books like that's the most important thing like we're all stuck at home we all need books we all need good books and so I'm I'm delighted to play even a small part in connecting the writers writing good books for you with you so um, that's that's how we're adapting Thanks, Jenna. That's a it's a great way to end, I think, with saying the, the library is the nucleus of the community. So it definitely is. It's and it's so on. beautiful. You're like, in real life, I'm gonna come back to the library and I'll bring everybody a roast duck. <laughs> well, the, the good news is I'm gonna reach off one of my shelves and grab a uh, a print of the library that one of one of uh, Lowell's more popular artists who typically makes the event, uh, Janet Lambert Moore, for everyone out there, she typically can attend, she couldn't tonight. Uh, but we'll get this to you. It's a great print that we've typically given to every author we've Oh, had. that's for me? That's for you. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was like a historic. Uh, no, no, no. Person. Oh so my God, I love it. It'll be on one of those walls we saw today. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's beautiful. It absolutely will. I know exactly where I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it yeah. off over my um, uh, German Lost Family book cover. So then I can Perfect. show you guys off too. Thank you. That's so kind. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story and sharing your home today. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you guys for, again, for the privilege of your time. Like I'm basically stealing from NBC now, but um, I really mean it. I know there are other things that you could be doing. You could be shopping online. You could be making roast duck. You could be walking a dog or hanging out with loved ones or binge watching something. And you're here giving your support to the library. Um, and giving your support to an author. And, and I love this. So I am really indebted to you all. And thank you for having me, Jamie and Belinda. It's just a joy. Thank you. So if folks want to unmute themselves and applaud, Jenna, uh, feel free. <laughs> thank you, Jenna. <laughs> Woo! You're so welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If anyone has any follow-up questions, uh, feel sure. free to reach out to myself or Belinda as well. We're happy to... Uh, coordinate with you folks on the book plates as well. So thank you everyone for your time and thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you sponsors. <laughs> thank you everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Well, bye. bye everybody. Nice to see you and thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, your turn. Just gotta quit the meeting. Yeah, it's all done. You can close it. I'll uh, I'll I'll end the meeting. <laughs>